All right, we want to follow along. You can go to our website, rmfchurch.org, click on media, then notes. And today's message is resting in God's faithfulness. So when she started talking about faithfulness, I went, maybe she saw me behind my shoulder, my notes or something, I don't know, but she did not. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for helping us to walk according to your word so that we could see the promises manifested in our life. We thank you for the Holy Ghost to speak through me, to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 3, 5 or 4 through 6. This is the Living Bible. It says, if you want favor with both God and man and a reputation of good judgment and common sense, then trust the Lord completely. Don't ever trust yourself in everything you do. Put God first and He will direct you and crown your efforts with success. God wants us to be successful. He's given us wisdom. He's given us His voice. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice so we can make better decisions. And I'm telling you what, in this day and age, the way the economy is, and there's a lot going on in the world, uh, you need to be wise in making great financial decisions. Amen? But faithfulness, it means steadfast loyalty that isn't easily swayed. To be faithful to something is to be devoted to it, dedicated, committed, and loyal. To be faithful means to be trustworthy and reliable. Faithfulness could be, or faithful can be faithful or full of faith in God. Full of faith in God. Proverbs 28, 20 says this. Life's blessings drench the honest and faithful person. But punishment rains down upon the greedy and dishonest. It's not that God, you know, God is not in the punishing business, just so you know. Anytime that there is judgment or punishment, it's the same. You need to have the same mentality as a parent. When you punish your child, it is for their benefit. They may not know it then, but when they get into their 20s maybe, they, they look back and go, I understand now. Possibly 30s, I don't know where it's at. But some places they get older and they go, thank you for disciplining me, causing me to... Be helped. God is the same way. God is the same way. But I'm going to talk to three about three areas of faithfulness. Not that this is the only thing. But three areas of faithfulness is being faithful to God. Being faithful to friends. And God being faithful to us. So the first one, being faithful to God. What does that look like? When somebody says, you know, you need to be faithful to God. What does that look like? Uh, I'll say this because it may come a surprise to you, but um, it doesn't depend upon your performance. And uh, there's a great scripture that Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. He said this, but God's amazing grace has made me who I am, and his grace to me was not fruitless. In fact, I worked harder than all the rest. And the King James says, all of the rest of the apostles that's kind of bodacious, or almost sounds prideful, doesn't it, to you? Paul sits there and says, I've worked harder than all of them. Well, pat yourself on the back, Paul. I've worked harder than all of them. But let's keep reading. Yet, not in my own strength, but God's. For His empowering grace is poured out upon me. He's saying, I worked harder than everybody, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God upon my life that was being manifested in and through me. That is tremendous. That just gives me great insight and revelation when it comes to about being faithful to God or even people say working for God, but in reality we need to change that and be and to say because of what Paul just said that we work with God, not for God. That's a big difference. I know that may sound kind of funny, but we need to be able to work with God. Why? Because you can't work for God, but you will 
do a lot better and work a lot easier when you rely upon the grace that is in you and me to be faithful and to work for God. Or work with God, I should say. It's the grace of God. Paul said, I work really, really hard. But he learned something that I believe the church, including myself, we haven't had the revelation that we should. And that is we need to rely upon the grace of God that is in us so that we can work what he wants us to work. So that there can be fruit born or to bear in our lives. If you're going to bear fruit, God says, I can help you with that. You know, I've said this. We have fruit trees at our house. I've given this illustration about 100 times. This is 101 if you're keeping tabs. I've never seen one of my fruit trees just out there shaking. Just shaking, thinking that I've really got to work hard to produce fruit. I've really got to work hard. No, you know what? It's, it's, it comes natural to my apple trees. It comes natural to my Asian pear trees. Help me out. Is that it? We used to have nectarine trees, but they gave up the ghosts. I think that's it. But they don't struggle and produce some fruit. Why? It's a natural thing. It's a natural thing for you and I to produce fruit. It's not something that we should really have to strive and work really hard at and, and be so tenacious about it. This is what Paul said. I'm tenacious. I am very disciplined. I do so much work every day of my life. But it's not I that doeth the work. It is Christ in me. I don't know about you, but that, doesn't that sound a lot easier and better? You know, when people get burned out, when people get stressed out, you know what it is? It's you. And we need to, we need to go to God and say, you know what, Lord, I've been stressed out. I've been getting burned out on this. And I, I know that's not you. I need to understand, yield to the grace that is in me to work. You know? I mean, I see moms with kids, sometimes lots of kids, and I just think, Lord, help her. Just help. In a grocery store, I mean, and they're, and they're touching and doing everything. And there's glass stuff around, and you just think, <laughs> you want to help her, but you know. You, but... Uh, the grace of God is in every woman, every mother to raise those kids so she does not lose her mind. And all the women said, and a man can be really, really under a lot of pressure and stress at his job at work or a woman, anybody who, who has a job. But my point is this, that if you're working, there's been times that I used to work for FedEx. And man, I mean, I was a supervisor and there would be times that, I mean, we had, it was all about deadlines. It was all about time. You had to have this done at a certain time. You had to have that done. We had to turn an aircraft in so many minutes. We, I mean, it was just a lot of stress. And there's times that, you know, all of our crew would just be pulling their hair out. But I remember driving to work one day and I said, Lord... I'm your vessel. You want me to prosper, whatever I put my hand to. So I'm just praying that you help me to lead these people and this not to be a stressful job. It's amazing how things get turned around. We have to think that way. You have to believe that way. So being faithful to God, what does that look like to you? To a lot of people, it's like, well, oh, man, I, I'm not... I, I don't do enough for God. I don't do, and, and people get under guilt and condemnation. If, that, if that's your ticket, then you're on the wrong path. This is not a message, and God doesn't want everybody to get, you know, because, you know, if I can just get people to feel guilty and, and condemned, man, people will start helping out more in the church. I'm smiling. That is, that is not what I want, and that's definitely not what God wants. He does not want everybody to be stressed out or peer pressured or manipulated. No manipulation. God is not a manipulator. But this is what I do know. There are so many giftings and talents within people. And uh, I meant to bring that book. I, I started reading a book by a friend of mine, Karen Conrad, about purpose. Everybody should read it, but especially the young people should read it. I'll 
try to remember to bring it next week to show it to you. Because everybody has a purpose. Everybody has things inside of us. And God, by His grace, wants that to be manifested. You know the story of the ten, of the ten talents, or the five talents? Two talents, I just went blank in one talent. Is it five, two, one? It doesn't sound right, but it's five, two, one, right? Five talents, one guy, and his master gave it to them. And he said, I want you to invest these five. I want you to invest the two. I want you to invest your one. So he didn't give everybody the same because everybody's capacity is different. So he doesn't expect somebody who has one to produce five more. He expects you to take the one and invest it and have two. And then if you have two, you can invest that and get four. And then if you have four, you can invest that and get... You see the story? But everybody that had five and two, he said this, Well done, my good and faithful servant. But the one, it was given to him, but he didn't take ownership of it. And he said, I hid your talent. I hid your talent. And see, that was the wrong mentality. The master says, this is your talent I've given to you. Now you do something with it. Do something with it. You have the grace, you have the gifting, you have the talent to do it. <laughs> Get it? The talent to do it. Anyway, so you have, you have the ability to do it. But he hid it. He did nothing with it. And sometimes we do that as believers, as people in general. We don't do and we're not faithful with what we've been given. We have not been faithful to what we've been given. We need to take ownership of what we've been given. What are you good at? What are you good at? I mean, my wife is majorly good at detail orientation and organization. That's not even on this body at all. <laughs> but I'm thankful the Lord gave me her so I could be a pastor of a church. Because I could not be a pastor of a church if it wasn't for my wife. Because we probably wouldn't have children's ministry or any kind of ministry. I would just get up and say, I, I need help, people. <laughs> Somebody help me. Dear Lord, have mercy on me and help me. But we have all been given things for the glory of God. So you are empowered with the grace of God. But sometimes we don't use that grace. I, I totally believe believers should never be stressed out. And I know me and some, all, all of you, okay, let's just be real. Sometimes we are. When we are, you can rest assured that you're leaning on your strength and not upon His. You're leaning upon your ability and not upon the grace that is in us. And that's the time you need to say, God, help me to just to lean upon your grace right now. Help me. I want to be like Paul. Paul must have had such a revelation. He said, it's not I. I worked harder than everybody, but it wasn't I who was doing the work. It was the enabling grace of God that was working in me and through me. 1 Timothy 1.12 says this, And I think Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. He's been enabled by God because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So he said, faithfulness can be counted. How is it counted? Well, how many times you show up? How many times you're doing what God wants you to do? And I'm not just talking about ministry stuff. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about the time that you felt like maybe you should have uh, helped somebody, but you didn't. Maybe sometime you, you should have talked to a stranger, but you didn't because you're an introvert. And so, you know, no, I don't want to do that. And God says, yeah, I want you to say something to them. I want you to tell them, you know what? God loves you or whatever. Little things, man. I have come to, to the conclusion it's the little things in life that causes just explosion in people's lives to cause them to be blessed and helped. Buying somebody a cup of coffee. Doing something for somebody. There's grace inside of all of us to, to help people. And to just, you know what it's doing? It's all about showing the love of God to people. Showing the love of God to people. We need to be able to yield to the Spirit of God to do that. In Luke chapter 16, it says that he that is faithful in little will be faithful in much. You know, a lot of times people want to... 
to have a big major business? Well, this is the, the thing that I know. When I was uh, going to Bible school, um, at that time it was just Danielle and I. She was three years old, four years old, something like that. And so I had to get room and board for us. And so I got a, a, a couple who had a house, a big house, and I got to um, live, we got to live in their home. And the Lord said this to me, I'll never forget. He says, if you help this couple to take care of their home and be good stewards of this home, he says, I'll make sure that you get a nice home. Faithful and little, you'll be faithful and much. Being faithful in the job, you want a big time business? How faithful you are for the job that you're doing now. The pastor, he's such a jerk. Is there anybody that has worked for somebody that you've never worked for a jerk? I mean, if you are, God bless you. Am I just being too transparent for y'all? Just tell me if I am. I mean, if if I am. But I mean, I'm just being honest. I've worked for some great, tremendous bosses at FedEx. And then I've worked for some, I mean, they weren't Satan, but they were related to him. And I just thought, dear Lord, have mercy. And you know what? The Lord taught me to work just as hard for them as I worked for the the ones that were good. Why? Because God says this, when you do your work, do it as unto the Lord. Oh, that puts a whole different perspective on it. So I just say I'm not working for that satanic guy right there. I'm working for the Lord. I didn't say that to him, just so you know. I didn't want to be fired. But, uh, I mean, I mean, and so mistreated. I mean, just because, you know, I wasn't one of his... Okay, I'm not going to go there. But anyway, he, he didn't like me. And so, but I still worked hard. I still worked hard. And you know what? If we have the mentality that I'm not working for him, I'm working for God, you'll get promoted. You'll get... Faithfulness does not mean that you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that we're, we won't struggle from time to time or make some poor decisions. It does mean that we will continue to trust God even when life is difficult. Being faithful to God. All right, the next one, being faithful to friends. The Bible says something about being faithful to friends. Proverbs 27, 9 and 10. Sweet friendships refresh the soul and awaken our hearts with joy. For good friends are like the anointed oil that yields the fragrant incense of God's presence. So never give up on a friend or abandon a friend of your father. Or For in the day of your brokenness, you won't have to run to, to a relative for help. A friend nearby is better than a relative far away. So God wants you to be faithful to your friends. Maybe you didn't hear me. God wants you to be faithful to your friends. Even when they're not perfect. Even when they don't do things. Even when they are offensive to you from time to time. I try to be a good friend. The Bible says he that wants friends to show himself friendly. You know, people who say, you know, I don't have any friends at all. Well, my advice to you is, are you being friendly to people? Okay, we'll go on to something else. But anyway, God wants us to have friends. I don't care how much an introvert you are or whatever. God still, you need friends. We all need relationships. We need friends. And listen, it's easy to cut off relationships when they do something bad or wrong to you. But honey, let's just get real. If you do that constantly, you will have zero friends. Because... To the best of my knowledge and ability, nobody's perfect. And we say things that we shouldn't and do things we shouldn't. So we just got to, I'll just say this, we got to suck it up sometime and just say, you know what, I'm going to overlook that. I'm going to overlook it. But you can also communicate as well. A lot of times people get offended and they don't communicate and they leave. A lot of times people will leave the church because they're offended. You know what, you could have, we could have talked it through and communicated and been all right. 
People quit jobs, quit churches, quit relationships, quit marriages. They just quit because of offense instead of saying, hey, let's talk this through. Woo, that's good. Communication. Proverbs 27.9 The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. The heartfelt counsel of a friend is sweet as perfume. It's good to have friends. Especially friends that will say, man, what are you doing? You are making some really bad decisions. Some poor decisions. You want a friend that will do that to you. You want somebody in your life that will say, you know, every time you hit yourself in the hand with a hammer, it's going to hurt. So you may want to stop doing that. And I know it just seems like loyalty and honor have seemed to have left the planet. It's easy for people not to be loyal. It's easy for people not to show honor. And everyone, and I do mean everyone, judges and are more critical of people than we should be. We are, including me. And sometimes it's just, it's just easy to see somebody or doing something wrong. You go, wow, well, how stupid can you be? And God just wants to say, you know what? The Lord <laughs> did this to, to me one time. Somebody was just being like that. And he says, that's my creation you're talking about. You've probably never done that, but you know, I, I did, and so I'm just giving an example. That's my creation. I created them. You know, my next thought is, why did you create him dumb? But I didn't. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> why did you create them? So stupid. Man, anyway, I didn't. I just wanted you to laugh, but anyway. God being faithful to us. That's the last one. I want to try to take a few more minutes on this. God being faithful to us. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. And he will establish you to the end, keep you steadfast, give you strength, and guarantee your vindication. He will be your warrant against all accusation or indictment so that you will be guiltless and irreproachable in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. God is faithful. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. And therefore, ever true to His promise. And He can be depended upon. By Him, you were called into companionship and participation with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I know that's a lot. But the bottom line is, God says, you can count on me. You can count on me. Philippians 1, 6 says this, being confident of this very thing. Now listen to me. Being confident means this. That means you have to work on that. All of us, at one given time, we're not confident in that if God's going to come through for us. We're not confident that uh, for the scripture, by his stripes, we're healed. We're not confident that my God meets all of my need according to his riches and glory. We're not confident that my steps are ordered of the Lord. We're not confident that God is a bright morning star to us. That he will lead us and guide us in every area of our life. We're not confident a lot of times. Is that right? So how do we change that? That's on you and me. That's on you and me. God wants us to be confident. Paul said, I am confident. How did Paul get confident? He meditated upon what God did to him. That was a great story, what Melody said. That Sometimes we just need to know what God did for us in our past. I remember when we were on Club Manor renting that building. And, uh, uh, I mean, we, it was a stretch for us. We were renting it for $1,500 a month when we first started. And then eventually, you know, he raised it to three, or 2000 Then he uh, raised it to $3,000 a month. And uh, so then we just went... I didn't want to sign a long-term contract with him because he kept raising it. And so I told the, the guy this. I said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go month to month. But any time that, you know, you get somebody, you sell the building, I need 60 days. I need 60 days because we're a church. You know, we can't just, you know, move a business, you know, like a business. We, you know, it, it's, 
I, I just need 60 days. He says, I give you my word, you'll have 60 days. Well, and that was the, uh, the property manager that I was dealing with. So the property manager, one day, I'm in Denver at a meeting, and in between the meetings, uh, I get a phone call. I answer it, and he says, Mike, um, one or two things. And I knew this, this is not good. One or two things. We're raising your rent to $5,000 a month. Went from three to five. And it starts next month. I want you to pay that. If you can't pay that, you know, you're going to need to, be, you need to move out because I've got somebody for that building. I said, well, right now we, we can't pay $5,000 a month. He says, okay, well, you need to move out. And I believe he gave me, did he give us three weeks? 40 days. 40 days. He gave us 40 days. So, uh, I said, I need more time than that. I said, you promised me two months. He says, I'm sorry. These people are going to move in. He already told them they could have the building. He knew. So anyway, and uh, I forgive him, just so you know. But anyway, that he lied to me. But uh, uh, the point is, is that I said, God, you knew this. So I believe that you are faithful to provide for us. He did it when we were at the hotel. Something like that similar happened when we were at hotel. And then miraculously, God gave us that club manor. And that was like, how many days was that? From the whole? Less than seven days. You remember the story? I told the church. I met the guy. He was uh, in Sterling, and he happened to be down here. And I met him. I said, you know, can we um, rent the facility? He says, well, uh, I'll tell you what. He got, I got to talk with my partner, so I'll let you know. And uh, I said, if we can rent it for $1,500, that that'd be great. He says, well, let me talk to my partner. So I didn't hear from him. That was the middle of the week. And so Sunday came, and, uh, uh, or was it a Wednesday night? Whatever. I went to church. We had a service, and, and I said, we're going to meet on 4021. 4021? Is that what the address? 4021 Club Manor. Melody, I could see her on the front row. Her mouth dropped down. Her eyes got really big. She says, you told them we were going to meet, and we don't know that we have that building. What are you going to do? If he comes back and says... No, you can't have it. I said, I'll be at the front door. I says, we're not meeting here today. We're going to be meeting someplace else. And she says, well, okay. I said, guess what? He called me back. We got the place. I called a bunch of people, and we went and straightened it out within just two or three days. I mean, we worked like 12, 14-hour days to straighten out so we could have church. God was faithful to get this building. It was just a faithful move of God. When he said, okay, you got to be out of Club Manor, you got, you got to be out of Club Manor. I had a friend who was a realtor, and he showed me all that uh, there were commercial buildings. There was none at that particular time that we could either afford or that, we, that looked good like a church. So he was in his office. We drove all the way by, and we went back to his office. We looked up, and this one came up on his screen. He goes, Mike, you don't want that one. I said, well, let me just go see it. He didn't even come with me. That's how bad he, he knew we wouldn't want this building. So we came, I, me and a friend, we drove into the parking lot. I got out, and as soon as my feet hit the, the pavement out there, I just felt, felt in my heart, this is the building. Before I even looked at it. This is being recorded. You may want to edit this. <laughs> the door was locked, and so I went all around, and I checked all the doors. And the windows. There was one that was open. I came in. It's called breaking and entering. But anyway. So I went in and I started taking a tour of the building. And then when I got back out, I called the, the realtor and says, I want this building. He says, well, you haven't even seen it. I go, yes, I have. How did you get in it? You don't want to know. But I want it. So anyway, for those who are listening, this is not a good example, just so you know. Don't do that. Say, well, pastor did it. No, don't go there. But anyway, uh, this is way too transparent, way too transparent. Anyway, Pueblo police will probably knock on my door tomorrow. But anyway, we, it's, we bought the building, so they can't do anything now. But anyway, 
the Lord got this building supernaturally. Ron, who's a bank president, said that bank should have never loaned you that money. Never should have loaned you that money. Not only that, they wanted me to get uh, our board members. They wanted about four or five or six signatures on that loan. I said, no, I'm not putting anybody's signature on that loan except me and my wife. They said, well, you know, we, we need more people in your organization. I said, take it or leave it. So Ron said that for a commercial loan, for a church, no bank does that or should do that. They did. And we got this for uh, $100,000 less than what he was asking for. $100,000. I think it was $450,000. I said, I'll give you $350,000. Give you $350,000. My realtor said, Mike, that's an embarrassment. I can't make that offer to him. I said, I just want you to do that. He says, I don't know if I can do that. He says, that, he may get mad and say, forget it. I said, I'm not afraid to hear no. I heard it a lot growing up. I'm still not afraid to hear no. He says, okay, I'll do it. So I offered him 350000 He came back and said, nope, I, you have to pay three seventy-five. dollars So he came down $75,000. My realtor was jumping and just excited. He says, I can't believe he came down seventy five. dollars I said, well, if he came down that far, he'll come down to three fifty. dollars He goes, Mike, <laughs> what are you doing? No, three seventy. dollars He came down to $75,000. I said, he only needs to come down $25,000 more. We got it. <laughs> He just went white. He goes, you know, you got, no, no. I said, I just have a peace about it in my heart. You know, I know you don't understand. I'm a pastor and I just want this. For, and 350 is good. I, I figured out the payments. I said, we can do 350. He says, okay. <laughs> Within 24 hours, I got a con, con, contacted me back. We got it for 350,000. Closed on the deal supernaturally. Ron says, you cannot close that quick on a commercial. He says, I don't even close on that quick in a residential. I don't know. It was literally a couple of weeks we were closed, I believe, on this and moved into it. So you need to remember things like that. How about you? You, you got some faithful stories? Yes. What God did for you? You need to remember that. Oh, my goodness. You need to remember that. I just know that God, let me give you one more other scripture because I went over I just feel like we need to have a revelation of the faithfulness of God. Of the faithfulness of God. Proverbs 3.3 3, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Evidently, you can let it forsake you. You can let God's faithfulness forsake you. He's faithful, but you can let it forsake you. How? So how do I do that? Don't let steadfast love, the love of God and the faithfulness of God forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him and He'll direct your paths. So that's what we say every week. But before that, it says don't let the love of God and the faithfulness of God forsake you. So I meditated and thought about that, and it tells you what to do. How can you do it? We do it all the time, by the way. The love of God, the faithfulness of God, we let it forsake us. We do. God doesn't. We do. How do you do it? You just forget. You don't trust Him. You don't rely upon Him. You don't depend upon Him. He said, write it down. Bind it. To, make it become part of you. It needs to become part of our life that God is faithful. Yes. And I mean, He's faithful and, he, and your prayer didn't get an answer the way you thought it would. I mean, He's faithful when you're believing and standing upon healing and, and it doesn't come through for you. It's not God's fault. And I'll just say this to all of us. When you get sick and or you have a pain, it doesn't go away. You can rest assured that it's not God withholding anything. Why? Because He's already given healing. It's hard to, for Him to withhold it when He's already given it to you. Are you hearing me? That will be like me saying, you know, I'll go up to Adam. I said, Adam, this is your water. This is yours now. And now Adam says, well, I'm thirsty. 
And he thinks, I'm withholding water from him. Adam, I gave you water. Yeah, but I, I, he's just, we get blinded to things. But the faithfulness of God says, I've given you water. It's my water. <laughs> you didn't drink out of it, did you? <laughs> We're close, but not that close. <laughs> but this is the thing. We got to remember that God's faithful no matter what. It's got to be in your foundation and mine. We can't say, oh, I didn't get that prayer answered, so I, I, don't, I can't believe in the, the trust and trust God. He's not faithful. No. It's on our end that we're missing it. But I don't meditate upon that. I just feel like I dust myself off and get back up and go, whoo, God's faithful and I'm trusting him. Amen. You dust yourself off and you say God's faithful. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. You remember that? Yeah. You have to be older than 40, 50, then maybe. The, they, those wobbles, they wobble, and you can push them down, but they just come back up. That's a believer. That's you. That's me. You can, I can get knocked down, but honey, and when the dust settles, I'm standing because of the greater one being in me. All right? I went over. Oh, my goodness. I went over. Let's stand. Speaking of standing. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, faithfulness, being faithful to God, being faithful to our friends, and having a revelation that God is faithful to us. Three areas. We can be faithful to God. But let's just rely and depend upon the grace that it sent us. We can be faithful to our friends. If you cut off a relationship, maybe this message is for you today. Call them back up. Say, hey, let's go have coffee this week. There's, don't get me wrong. There's some relationships. And when I was younger, the Lord says, you need to cut that off. But there's relationships that I think we cut off because of our own flesh that we get offended because they said something to us. But let's be faithful to our friends. And then let's not forsake the faithfulness of God. Let's not forsake it. We all have from time to time. Man, let's get back at it. God's faithful to you. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your goodness. That our eyes to be open. Our eyes to be open. Give us revelation to see. Like Paul saw. And he said it wasn't I, but it was the grace of God in me that caused me to be able to work so hard. It was not me. It was the grace of God. And to be faithful to our friends. To nurture our relationships. And Father, not to forsake. Help us not to forsake the love and the faithfulness of you. Because you cannot deny yourself. You are faithful. Your yes is a yes. Your no is a no. And all of the promises are yes unto us. So thank you for them, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.